Among the Corn Rows from Main Traveled Roads by Hamlin Garland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part One but the road sometimes passes a rich meadow where the songs of larks and bobolinks and blackbirds are tangled. Rob held up his hands from which the dough depended in ragged strings. Biscuits, he said, with an elaborate working of his jaws, intended to convey the idea that they were going to be specially delicious. Seagraves laughed, but did not enter the shanty door. How do you like batching it? oh don't mention it entreated rob mauling the dough again come in and sit down why in thunder you standin out there for oh i'd rather be where i can see the prairie great weather immense how goes the breaking tip-top a little dry now but the bulls pull the plow through two acres a day how's things in boomtown oh same old grind judge still lyin still at it major mullen still swearing to it you hit it like a mallet railroad schemes are thicker'n prairie chickens you've got grit rob i don't have anything but crackers and sardines over to my shanty and here you are making soda biscuit i have to do it couldn't break if i didn't you editors can take things easy lay around on the prairie and watch the plovers and meadowlarks but we settlers have got to work Leaving Rob to sputter over his cooking, Seagraves took his slow way off down toward the oxen, grazing in a little hollow. The scene was characteristically, wonderfully beautiful. It was about five o'clock in a day in late June, and the level plain was green and yellow, and infinite in reach as a sea. The lowering sun was casting over its distant swells a faint, impalpable mist, through which the breaking teams on the neighboring claims ploughed noiselessly as figures in a dream. The whistle of gophers, the faint wailing fluttering cry of the falling plover, the whirr of the swift-winged prairie pigeon, or the quack of a lonely duck came through the shimmering air. The lark's infrequent whistle, piercingly sweet, broke from the longer grass in the swales nearby. No other climate, sky, plain, could produce the same unnameable weird charm. No tree to wave, no grass to rustle, scarcely a sound of domestic life, only the faint melancholy suing of the wind in the short grass, and the voices of the wild things of the prairie. Seagraves, an impressionable young man, junior editor of the Boomtown Spike, threw himself down on the sod, pulled his hat rim down over his eyes, and looked away over the plain. It was the second year of Boomtown's existence, and Seagraves had not yet grown restless under its monotony. Around him the gophers played saucily. Teams were moving here and there across the sod with a peculiar, noiseless, effortless motion that made them seem as calm, lazy, and unsubstantial as the mist through which they made their way. Even the sound of passing wagons was a sort of low, well-fed, self-satisfied chuckle. Seagraves, holding down a claim near Rob, had come to see his neighboring batch because of feeling the need of company, but now that he was near enough to hear him prancing about getting supper, he was content to lie alone on a slope of the green sod. The silence of the prairie at night was well-nigh terrible. Many a night, as Seagraves lay in his bunk against the side of his cabin, he would strain his ear to hear the slightest sound, and be listening thus sometimes for minutes before the squeak of a mouse or the step of a passing fox came as a relief to the aching sense. In the daytime, however, and especially on a morning, the prairie was another thing. The pigeons, the larks, the cranes, the multitudinous voices of the ground birds and snipes and insects made the air pulsate with sound, a chorus that died away into an infinite murmur of music. 
Hello, Seagraves, yelled Rob from the door. The biscuits are most done. Seagraves did not speak, only nodded his head and slowly rose. The faint clouds in the west were getting a superb flame color above and a misty purple below, and the sun had shot them with lances of yellow light. As the air grew denser with moisture, the sounds of neighboring life began to reach the ear. Children screamed and laughed, and afar off a woman was singing a lullaby. The rattle of wagons and voices of men speaking to their teams multiplied. Ducks in a neighboring lowland were quacking. The whole scene took hold upon Seagraves with irresistible power. "'It is American!' he exclaimed. "'No other land or time can match this mellow air, this wealth of color, much less the strange social conditions of life on this sunlit Dakota prairie.' Rob, though visibly affected by the scene also, couldn't let his biscuits spoil or go without proper attention. "'Say, ain't you coming to grub?' he asked impatiently. "'In a minute,' replied his friend, taking a last wistful look at the scene. "'I want one more look at the landscape.' "'Landscape be blessed. If you'd been breaking all day, come and take that stool and draw up.' "'No, I'll take the candle box.' "'Not much. I know what manners are, if I am a bull-driver.' Seagraves took the three-legged and rather precarious-looking stool and drew up to the table, which was a flat, broad box nailed up against the side of the wall, with two strips of board nailed at the outer corners for legs. "'How's that for a layout?' Rob inquired proudly. "'Well, you have spread yourself. Biscuit and canned peaches and sardines and cheese. Why, this is—is is prodigal.' "'It ain't nothing else.' Rob was from one of the finest counties of Wisconsin, over toward Milwaukee. He was of German parentage, a middle-sized, cheery, wide-awake, good-looking young fellow, a typical claim-holder. He was always confident, jovial, and full of plans for the future. He had dug his own well, built his own shanty, washed and mended his own clothing. He could do anything, and do it well. He had a fine field of wheat and was finishing the plowing of his entire quarter section. "'This is what I call settin' under a feller's own vine and fig tree,' after Seagrave's compliments. "'And I like it. I'm my own boss. No man can say come here and go there to me. I get up when I'm a mind to, and I go to bed when I'm a mind to.' "'Some drawbacks, I suppose.' "'Yes. Mice, for instance, give me a devilish lot of trouble.' They get into my flour barrel, eat up my cheese, and fall into my well. But it ain't no use to swear. The rats and mice, they made such a strife, he had to go to London to buy him a wife, quoted Seagraves. Don't blush, I probed your secret thought. Well, to tell the honest truth, said Rob a little sheepishly, leaning across the table, I ain't satisfied with my style of cooking. It's good, but a little too plain, you know. I'd like a change. It ain't much fun to break all day and then go to work and cook your own supper. Uh, no, I should say not. This fall I'm going back to Wisconsin. Girls are thick as huckleberries back there, and I'm going to bring one back. Now you hear me. Good, that's the plan, laughed Seagraves, amused at a certain timid and apprehensive look in his companion's eye. Just think what a woman would do to put this shanty in shape and think how nice it would be to take her arm and saunter out after supper and look at the farm and plan and lay out gardens and paths and tend the chickens rob's manly and self-reliant nature had the settler's typical buoyancy and hopefulness as well as a certain power of analysis which enabled him now to say the fact is we fellers holdin down claims out here ain't fools clear to the rhine we know a couple of things now i didn't leave wapak county for fun did you ever see wapak well it's one of the handsomest counties the sun ever shone on full of lakes and rivers and groves of timber i miss em all out here and i miss the boys and girls but they want no chance there for a feller land that was good was so blamed high you couldn't touch it with a ten-foot pole from a balloon rent was high if you wanted to rent 
and so a feller like me had to get out and now i'm out here i'm going to make the most of it another thing he went on after a pause we fellows working out back there got more and more like hands and less like human beings you know walpack is a kind of a summer resort and the people that used to come in summers looked down on us cusses in the fields and shops i couldn't stand it my god he said with a sudden impulse of rage quite unlike him i'd rather live on an iceberg and claw crabs for a livin than have some feller passin me on the road and callin me fella seagraves knew what he meant and listened in astonishment at this outburst i consider myself a sight better than any man who lives on somebody else's hard work i've never had a cent i didn't earn with them hands he held them up and broke into a grin beauties ain't they but they never wore gloves that some other poor cuss earned seagraves thought them grand hands worthy to grasp the hand of any man or woman living well so i come west just like a thousand other fellows to get a start where the cussed european aristocracy hadn't got a holt on the people i like it here of course i'd like the lakes and meadows of wapak better but i'm my own boss as i say and i'm going to stay my own boss if i have to live on crackers and wheat coffee to do it that's the kind of a hairpin i am in the pause which followed seagraves plunged deep into thought by rob's words leaned his head on his hand this working farmer had voiced the modern idea it was an absolute overturn of all the ideas of nobility and special privilege born of the feudal past rob had spoken upon impulse but that impulse appeared to seagraves to be right i'd like to use your ideas for an editorial rob he said my ideas exclaimed the astounded host pausing in the act of filling his pipe my ideas <laughs> why i didn't know i had any well you've given me some anyhow seagraves felt that it was a wild grand upstirring of the modern democrat against the aristocratic against the idea of caste and the privilege of living on the labor of others this atom of humanity how infinitesimal this drop in the ocean of humanity was feeling the nameless longing of expanding personality and had already pierced the conventions of society and declared as nil the laws of the land laws that were survivals of hate and prejudice he had exposed also the native spring of the immigrant by uttering the feeling that it is better to be an equal among peasants than a servant before nobles so i have good reasons for liking the country rob resumed in a quiet way the soil is rich the climate good so far and if i have a couple of decent crops you'll see a neat upright going up here with a porch and a bay window and you'll still be living here alone frying leathery flapjacks and chopping taters and bacon i think i see myself drawled rob going round all summer wearing the same shirt without washing and wiping on the same towel four straight weeks and wearing holes in my socks and eating musty ginger snaps moldy bacon and canned boston beans for the rest of my enduring days oh yes i guess not well see you later must go water my bulls as he went off down the slope seagraves smiled to hear him saying i wish that some kind-hearted girl would pity on me take and extricate me from the mess i'm in the angel how i'd bless her if this her home she'd make in my little old sod shanty on the plain the boys nearly fell off their chairs in the western house dining-room a few days later at seeing rob come in to supper with the collar and necktie as the finishing touch of a remarkable outfit hit him somebody it's a clean collar he started for congress he's going to get married put in seagraves in a tone that brought conviction what screamed jack adams o'neill and wilson in a breath that man that man replied seagraves amazed at rob who coolly took his seat squared his elbows pressed his collar down at the back and called for the bacon and eggs 
The crowd stared at him in a dead silence. "'Where's he going to do it?' asked Jack Adams. "'Where's he going to find a girl?' "'Ask him,' said Seagraves. "'I ain't tellin,' put in Rob, with his mouth full of potato. "'You're afraid of our competition.' that's right our competition jack not your competition come now rob tell us where you found her i ain't found her what and yet you're going away to get married i'm going to bring back a wife with me ten days from date i see his scheme put in jim rivers he's gone back east somewhere and he's going to propose to every girl he meets hold on interrupted rob holding up his fork ain't quite right every good-looking girl i beat well i'll be blacked exclaimed jack impatiently that simply lets me out any man with such a cheek ought to succeed interrupted seagraves that's what i say bawled hank whiting the proprietor of the house you fellers ain't got any enterprise to you why don't you go to work and help settle the country like men cause you ain't got no sand girls are thicker than huckleberries back east i say it's a dern shame easy henry said the elegant bank clerk wilson looking gravely about through his spectacles i commend the courage and the resolution of mr rodemaker i pray the lady may not mislike him for his complexion the shadowed livery of the burning sun shakespeare said adams at a venture brother in adversity when do you embark another jason on an untried sea hey said rob winking at seagraves oh i go to-night night train and return ten days from date i'll wager our wedding supper he brings a blonde said wilson in his clean-cut languid speech oh come now wilson that's too thin we all know that rule about dark merry and light i'll wager she'll be tall continued wilson i'll wager you friend rodemaker she'll be blonde and tall the rest roared at rob's astonishment and confusion the absurdity of it grew and they went into spasms of laughter but wilson remained impassive not the twitching of a muscle betraying that he saw anything to laugh at in the proposition mrs whiting and the kitchen girls came in wondering at the merriment rob began to get uneasy what is it what is it said mrs whiting a jolly little matron rivers put the case rob's on his way back to wisconsin to get married and wilson has offered to bet him that his wife will be blonde and tall and rob dasn't bet and they roared again why the idea the man's crazy said mrs whiting the crowd looked at each other this was hint enough they sobered nodding at each other ah i see i understand if the heat and the boston beans let up on him wilson don't badger a poor irresponsible fellow i thought something was wrong when i saw the collar oh keep it up said rob a little nettled by their evident intention to have fun with him soothe him soothe him said wilson don't be harsh rob rose from the table go to thunder you make me tired the fit is on him again he rose disgustedly and went out they followed him in single file the rest of the town caught on frank graham heaved an apple at him and joined the procession rob went into the store to buy some tobacco they followed and perched like crows on the counters till he went out then they followed him as before they watched him check his trunk they witnessed the purchase of the ticket the town had turned out by this time wapak announced the one nearest the victim wapak said the next man and the word was passed along the street uptown make a note of it said wilson wapak a county where a man's proposal for marriage is honored upon presentation sight drafts rivers struck up a song while rob stood around patiently bearing the jokes of the crowd 
We're looking rather seedy now while holding down our claims, and our vittles are not always of the best. And the mice play slyly round us as we lay down to sleep in our little old tod shanties on the claim. Yet we rather like the novelty of a living in this way, though the bill of fare is often rather tame. And we're happy as a clam on the land of Uncle Sam in our little old tar shanty on the claim. The train drew up at length to the immense relief of Rob, whose stoical resignation was beginning to weaken. Don't you wish you had sand? he yelled to the crowd as he plunged into the car thinking he was rid of them. But no, their last stroke was to follow him into the car, nodding, pointing to their heads, and whispering, managing in the half-minute the train stood at the platform to set every person in the car staring at the crazy man. Rob groaned and pulled his hat down over his eyes, an action which confirmed his tormentor's words and made several ladies click their tongues in sympathy. <coughs> Poor fellow! All aboard, said the conductor, grinning his appreciation at the crowd, and the train was off. Oh, won't we make him groan when he gets back, said Barney, the young lawyer who sang the shouting tenor. We'll meet him with the timbrel and the harp. Anybody want to wager? I've got two to one on a short brunette, said Wilson. Part Two Follow it far enough, and it may pass the bend in the river where the water laughs eternally over its shallows. A cornfield in July is a hot place. The soil is hot and dry. The wind comes across the lazily murmuring leaves, laden with a warm, sickening smell, drawn from the rapidly growing, broad-flung banners of the corn. The sun, nearly vertical, drops a flood of dazzling light and heat upon the field over which the cool shadows run, only to make the heat seem the more intense. Julia Peterson, faint with fatigue, was toiling back and forth between the corn rolls, holding the handles of the double-shovel corn-plough, while her little brother Otto rode the steaming horse. Her heart was full of bitterness, and her face flushed with heat, and her muscles aching with fatigue. The heat grew terrible. The corn came to her shoulders, and not a breath seemed to reach her, while the sun, nearing the noon mark, lay pitilessly upon her shoulders, protected only by a calico dress. The dust rose under her feet, and as she was wet with perspiration, it soiled her till with a woman's instinctive cleanliness she shuddered. Her head throbbed dangerously. What matter to her that the kingbird pitched jovially from the maples to catch a wandering blue-bottle fly, that the robin was feeding its young, that the bobolink was singing? All these things, if she saw them, only threw her bondage to labor into greater relief. Across the field, in another patch of corn, she could see her father, a big, gruff-voiced, wide-bearded Norwegian, at work also with the plough. The corn must be ploughed, and so she toiled on, the tears dropping from the shadow of the ugly sunbonnet she wore. Her shoes, coarse and square-toed, chafed her feet. Her hands, large and strong, were browned, or more properly burned, on the backs by the sun. The horse's harness creak cracked as he swung steadily and patiently forward, the moisture pouring from his sides, his nostrils distended. The field ran down to a road, and on the other side of the road ran a river, a broad, clear, shallow expanse at that point, and the eyes of the boy gazed longingly at the pond and the cool shadow each time that he turned at the fence. "'Say, Jule, I'm going in. Come, can't I?' come say he pleaded as they stopped at the fence to let the horse breathe i've let you go wade twice but that don't do any good my legs is all smarty cause old jack sweats so the boy turned around on the horse's back and slid back to his rump i can't stand it he burst out sliding off and darting under the fence father can't see 
the girl put her elbows on the fence and watched her little brother as he sped away to the pool throwing off his clothes as he ran whooping with uncontrollable delight soon she could hear him splashing about in the water a short distance up the stream and caught glimpses of his little shiny body and happy face how cool that water looked and the shadows there by the big basswood how that water would cool her blistered feet an impulse seized her and she squeezed between the rails of the fence and stood in the road looking up and down to see that the way was clear it was not a main travelled road no one was likely to come why not she hurriedly took off her shoes and stockings how delicious the cool soft velvet of the grass and sitting down on the bank under the great basswood whose roots formed an abrupt bank she slid her poor blistered chafed feet into the water her bare head leaned against the huge tree trunk and now as she rested the beauty of the scene came to her over her the wind moved the leaves a jay screamed far off as if answering the cries of the boy a kingfisher crossed and recrossed the stream with dipping sweep of his wings the river sang with its lips to the pebbles the vast clouds went by majestically far above the treetops and the snap and buzzing and ringing whirr of july insects made a ceaseless slumberous undertone of song solvent of all else the tired girl forgot her work she began to dream this would not last always some one would come to release her from such drudgery this was her constant tenderest and most secret dream he would be a yankee not a norwegian the yankees didn't ask their wives to work in the field he would have a home perhaps he'd live in town perhaps a merchant and then she thought of the drug clerk in rock river who had looked at her a voice broke in on her dream a fresh manly voice well by jinx if it ain't julia just the one i wanted to see the girl turned saw a pleasant-faced young fellow in a derby hat and a fifteen-dollar suit of diagonals rod rodemaker how come she remembered her situation and flushed looked down at the water and remained perfectly still ain't you going to shake hands you don't seem very glad to see me she began to grow angry if you had any eyes you'd see rob looked over the edge of the bank whistled turned away oh i see excuse me don't blame you a bit though good weather for corn he went on looking up at the trees corn seems to be pretty well forward he continued in a louder voice as he walked away still gazing into the air crops is looking first class in boomtown hello this otto yah ya little scamp get on to that horse again quick or i'll take your skin off and hang it on the fence what you been doin been in swimmin jiminy ain't it fun when do you get back said the boy grinning never you mind replied rob leaping the fence by laying his left hand on the top rail get on to that horse he tossed the boy up on the horse hung his coat on the fence i suppose the old man makes her plow same as usual yep said otto dog ding a man that'll do that i don't mind if it's necessary but it ain't necessary in this case he continued to mutter in this way as he went across to the other side of the field as they turned to come back rob went up and looked at the horse's mouth getting pretty near of age say uh, who's sparkin julia now anybody nobody except some old norwegians she won't have them poor once or two but she won't good for her uh, nobody comes to see her sunday nights eh nope only ty sanderson and old hoover but she goes off and leaves them said rob starting old jack across the field it was almost noon and jack moved reluctantly he knew the time of day as well as the boy he made this round after distinct protest in the meantime julia putting on her shoes and stockings went to the fence and watched the man's shining white shirt as he moved across the cornfield there had never been any special tenderness between them but she had always liked him they had been at school together she wondered why he had come back at this time of the year and wondered how long he would stay how long had he stood looking at her she flushed again at the thought of it but he wasn't to blame 
it was a public road she might have known better she stood under a little popple tree whose leaves shook musically at every zephyr and her eyes through half-shut lids roved over the sea of deep green glossy leaves dappled here and there by cloud shadows stirred here and there like water by the wind and out of it all a longing to be free from such toil rose like a breath filling her throat and quickening the motion of her heart must this go on forever this life of heat and dust and labor what did it all mean the girl laid her chin on her strong red wrists and looked up into the blue spaces between the vast clouds aerial mountains dissolving in a shoreless azure sea how cool and sweet and restful they looked if she might only lie out on the billowy snow-white sunlit edge the voices of the driver and the ploughman recalled her and she fixed her eyes again upon the slowly nodding head of the patient horse on the boy turned half about on the horse talking to the white-sleeved man whose derby hat bobbed up and down quite curiously like the horse's head would she ask him to dinner what would her people say whew it's hot was the greeting the young fellow gave as he came up he smiled in a frank boyish way as he hung his hat on the top of a stake and looked up at her do you know i kind of enjoy getting at it again fact it ain't no work for a girl though he added when do you get back she asked the flush not yet out of her face rob was looking at her thick fine hair and full scandinavian face rich as a rose in color and did not reply for a few seconds she stood with her hideous sunbonnet pushed back on her shoulders a kingbird was chattering overhead oh a few days ago how long you going to stay oh i don't know week baby a far-off halloo came pulsing across the shimmering air the boy screamed dinner and waved his hat with an answering whoop then flopped off the horse like a turtle off a stone into water he had the horse unhooked in an instant and had flung his toes up over the horse's back in act to climb on when rob said ya yeah, young feller wait a minute tired he asked the girl with a tone that was more than kindly it was almost tender yes she replied in a low voice my shoes hurt me well here you go he replied taking his stand by the horse and holding out his hand like a step she colored and smiled a little as she lifted her foot into his huge hard sunburned hand oops a daisy he called she gave a spring and sat the horse like one at home there rob had a deliciously unconscious abstracted business-like air he really left her nothing to do but enjoy his company while he went ahead and did precisely as he pleased we don't raise much corn out there and so i kind of like to see it once more i wish i didn't have to see another hill of corn as long as i live replied the girl bitterly don't know as i blame it a bit but all the same i'm glad you was working in it today he thought to himself as he walked beside her horse toward the house will you stop to dinner she inquired bluntly almost surlily it was evident that there were reasons why she didn't mean to press him to do so you bet i will he replied that is if you want i should uh, you know how we live she replied evasively if you can stand it why she broke off abruptly yes he remembered how they lived in that big square dirty white frame house it had been three or four years since he had been in it but the smell of the cabbage and onions the penetrating peculiar mixture of odors assailed his memory as something unforgettable i guess i'll stop he said as she hesitated she said no more but tried to act as if she were not in any way responsible for what came afterward i guess i can stand for one meal what you stand all the while he added as she left him at the well and went to the house he saw her limp painfully and the memory of her face so close to his lips as he helped her down from the horse gave him pleasure at the same time that he was touched by its tired and gloomy look mrs peterson came to the door of the kitchen looking just the same as ever broad-faced unwieldy flabby apparently wearing the same dress he remembered to have seen her in years before a dirty drab-colored thing she looked as shapeless as a sack of wool 
Her English was limited to, How de do, Rob? He washed at the pump while the girl, in the attempt to be hospitable, held a clean towel for him. You're pretty well used up, eh? he said to her. Yes, it's awful hot out there. Can't you lay off this afternoon? It ain't right. No, he won't listen to that. Well, let me take your place. No, there ain't any use of that. Peterson, a brawny, wide-bearded Norwegian, came up at this moment and spoke to Rob in a sullen, gruff way. Hello, when you'll get back? Today. He ain't very glad to see me, said Rob, winking at Julia. He ain't bilin' over with enthusiasm. But I can stand it for your sake, he added with amazing assurance. But the girl had turned away, and it was wasted. At the table he ate heartily of the beans wagon, which filled a large wooden bowl in the center of the table, and which was ladled into smaller wooden bowls at each plate. Julia had tried hard to convert her mother to Yankee ways, and had at last given it up in despair. Rob kept on safe subjects, mainly asking questions about the crops of Peterson, and when addressing the girl, inquired of the schoolmates. By skillful questioning, he kept the subject of marriage uppermost, and seemingly was getting an inventory of the girls not yet married or engaged. It was embarrassing for the girl. She was all too well aware of the difference between her home and the home of her schoolmates and friends. She knew that it was not pleasant for her Yankee friends to come to visit her when they could not feel sure of a welcome from the tireless, silent, and grim-visaged old Norse, if indeed they could escape insult. Julia ate her food mechanically, and it could hardly be said that she enjoyed the brisk talk of the young man. His eyes were upon her so constantly, and his smile so obviously addressed to her. She rose as soon as possible, and going outside, took a seat on a chair under the trees in the yard. She was not a coarse or dull girl. In fact, she had developed so rapidly, by contact with the young people of the neighborhood, that she no longer found pleasure in her own home. She didn't believe in keeping up the old-fashioned Norwegian customs, and her life with her mother was not one to breed love or confidence. She was more like a hired hand. The love of the mother for her Yulgi was sincere, though rough and inarticulate, and it was her jealousy of the young Yankees that widened the chasm between the girl and herself, an inevitable result. Rob followed the girl out into the yard, and threw himself on the grass at her feet, perfectly unconscious of the fact that this attitude was exceedingly graceful and becoming to them both. He did it because he wanted to talk to her, and the grass was cool and easy. There wasn't any other chair, anyway. Do they keep up the lyceum and the sociable same as ever? Yes, the others go a good deal, but I don't. We're getting such a stock round us, and Father thinks he needs me so much. I don't get out often. I'm getting sick of it. I should think you would, he replied, his eyes on her face. I could stand the churnin' and housework, but when it comes to workin' outdoors in the dirt and hot sun, gettin' all sunburned and chapped up, it's another thing. And then it seems as if he gets stingier and stingier every year. I ain't had a new dress in I don't know how long. He says it's all nonsense, and Mother's just about as bad. She don't want a new dress, and so she thinks I don't. The girl was feeling the influence of a sympathetic listener and was making up for her long silence. I've tried to go out to work, but they won't let me. They'd have to pay a hand twenty dollars a month for the work I do, and they like cheap help but I'm not going to stand it much longer, I can tell you that. Rob thought she was very handsome as she sat there with her eyes fixed on the horizon, while these rebellious thoughts found utterance in her quivering, passionate voice. Yuli, come here! roared the old man from the well. A frown of anger and pain came into her face. She looked at Rob. That means more work. Say, let me go out in your place. Come now, what's the use? No, it wouldn't do no good. It ain't today so much. It's every day, and... Yuli! 
called Peterson again with a string of impatient Norwegian. Well, all right, only I'd like to. Well, good-bye, she said with a little touch of feeling. When do you go back? I don't know. I'll see you again before I go. Good-bye. He stood watching her slow, painful pace till she reached the well, where Otto was standing with the horse. He stood watching them as they moved out into the road and turned down toward the field. He felt that she had sent him away, but still there was a look in her eyes which was not altogether... He gave it up in despair at last. He was not good at analyses of this nature. He was used to plain, blunt expressions. There was a woman's subtlety here, quite beyond his reach. He sauntered slowly off up the road after his talk with Julia. His head was low on his breast. He was thinking as one who is about to take a decided and important step. He stopped at length and, turning, watched the girl moving along in the deeps of the corn. Hardly a leaf was stirring. The untempered sunlight fell in a burning flood upon the field. The grasshoppers rose, snapped, buzzed, and fell. The locust uttered its dry, heat-intensifying cry. The man lifted his head. "'It's a damn shame,' he said, beginning rapidly to retrace his steps. He stood leaning on the fence, awaiting the girl's coming, very much as she had waited his on the round he had made before dinner. He grew impatient at the slow gait of the horse, and drummed on the rail while he whistled. Then he took off his hat and dusted it nervously. As the horse got a little nearer, he wiped his face carefully, pushed his hat back on his head, and climbed over the fence, where he stood with elbows on the middle rail as the girl and boy and horse came to the end of the furrow. "'Hot, ain't it?' he said as she looked up. "'Jiminy, Peters, it's awful!' puffed the boy. The girl did not reply as she swung the plough about after the horse and set it upright into the next row. Her powerful body had a superb swaying motion at the waist as she did this, a motion which affected Rob vaguely, but massively. "'I thought you'd gone,' she said gravely, pushing back her bonnet, so he could see her face, dewed with sweat and pink as a rose. She had the high cheekbones of her race, but she had also their exquisite fairness of color. "'Say, Otto,' asked Rob alluringly, "'want to go swimming?' "'You bet,' replied Otto. "'Well, I'll go around if the boy dropped off the horse, not waiting to hear any more.' Rob grinned, but the girl dropped her eyes, then looked away. "'Got rid of him mighty quick. Uh, "'Say, Julie, I hate like thunder to see you out here. "'It ain't right. I wish you'd—' "'I wish—' She could not look at him now, and her bosom rose and fell with a motion that was not due to fatigue. Her moist hair, matted round her forehead, gave her a boyish look. Rob nervously tried again, tearing splinters from the fence. "'Say now, I'll tell you what I came back here for. To get married. And if you're willin', I'll do it tonight. Come now, what do you say?' "'What have I got to do about it?' she finally asked, the color flooding her face and a faint smile coming to her lips. "'Go ahead. I ain't got anything.' Rob put a splinter in his mouth and faced her. "'Oh, looky here now, Julia, you know what I mean. I've got a good claim out near Boomtown, a rattlin' good claim. A shanty on it, fourteen by sixteen, no tarred paper about it, and a cellar to keep butter in, and a hundred acre sweet just about ready to turn now. I need a wife.' Here he straightened up, threw away the splinter, and took off his hat. He was a very pleasant figure as the girl stole a look at him. His black, laughing eyes were especially earnest just now. His voice had a touch of pleading. The popple tree over their heads murmured applause at his eloquence, then hushed to listen. A cloud dropped a silent shadow down upon them, and it sent a little thrill of fear through Rob, as if it were an omen of failure. As the girl remained silent, looking away, he began, man-fashion, to desire her more and more as he feared to lose her. He put his hat on the post again and took out his jackknife. Her calico dress draped her supple and powerful figure simply but naturally. The stoop in her shoulders, given by labor, 
disappeared as she partly leaned upon the fence. The curves of her muscular arms showed through her sleeve. It's all fired lonesome for me out there on that claim, and it ain't no picnic for you here. Now, if you'll come out there with me, you needn't do anything but cook for me, and after harvest we can get a good layout of furniture, and I'll lath and plaster the house and put a little L in the rear. He smiled, and so did she. He felt encouraged to say, And there we be, as snug as you please. We're close to Boomtown, and we can go down there to church sociables and things, and they're a jolly lot there. The girl was still silent, but the man's simple enthusiasm came to her charged with passion and a sort of romance such as her hard life had known little of. There was something enticing about this trip to the West. "'What'll my folks say?' she said at last. A virtual surrender, but Rob was not acute enough to see it. He pressed on eagerly. "'I don't care, do you? They'll just keep you plowing corn and milking cows till the day of judgment. Come, Judy, I ain't got no time to fool away. I've got to get back to that grain. It's a whoopin' old crop, sure as you're born, and that means something pretty scrumptious in furniture this fall. Come now.' He approached her and laid his hand on her shoulder, very much as he would have touched Albert Seagraves or any other comrade. What do you say? She neither started nor shrunk nor looked at him. She simply moved a step away. They'd never let me go, she replied bitterly. I'm too cheap a hand. I do a man's work and get no pay at all. You'll have half of all I can make, he put in. "'How long can you wait?' she asked, looking down at her dress. "'Just two minutes,' he said, pulling out his watch. "'It ain't no use to wait. "'The old man'll be just as mad a week from now as he is today. "'Why not go now?' "'I'm of age day after tomorrow,' she mused, wavering, calculating. "'You can be of age tonight if you'll just call on old Squire Hatfield with me.' "'All right, Rob,' the girl said, turning and holding out her hand. "'That's the talk!' he exclaimed, seizing it. "'And now a kiss to bind the bargain, as the fellow says. "'I guess we can get along without that.' "'No, we can't. It won't seem like an engagement without it.' "'It ain't going to seem much like one anyway,' she answered, "'with a sudden realization of how far from her dreams of courtship this reality was. "'Say now, Julie, that ain't fair. It ain't treating me right. "'You don't seem to understand that I like you.' but i do rob was carried quite out of himself by the time the place and the girl he had said a very moving thing the tears sprang involuntarily to the girl's eyes do you mean it if you do you may she was trembling with emotion for the first time the sincerity of the man's voice had gone deep he put his arm around her almost timidly and kissed her on the cheek a great love for her springing up in his heart. "'That settles it,' he said. "'Don't cry, Julia. You'll never be sorry for it. Don't cry. It, it kind of hurts me to see it.' He didn't understand her feelings. He was only aware that she was crying, and tried in a bungling way to soothe her. But now that she had given way, she sat down in the grass and wept bitterly. "'Yulie!' yelled the old Norwegian like a distant foghorn. The girl sprang up. The habit of obedience was strong. "'No, you sit right there, and I'll go around,' he said. Otto. The boy came scrambling out of the wood, half-dressed. Rob tossed him upon the horse, snatched Julia's sunbonnet, put his own hat on her head, and moved off down the corn-rows, leaving the girl smiling through her tears as he whistled and chirped to the horse. Farmer Peterson, seeing the familiar sunbonnet above the corn-rows, went back to his work with the sentence of Norwegian trailing after him like the tail of a kite, something about lazy girls who didn't earn the crust of their bread, etc. Rob was wild with delight. Get up there, Jack! Hey, you old corn crib! Say, Otto, can you keep your mouth shut if it puts money in your pocket? Just try me and see, said this keen-eyed little scamp. Well, you keep quiet about my being here this afternoon. And I'll put a dollar on your tongue. Hey, what? Understand? Show me your dollars, said the boy, turning about and showing his tongue. All right. Begin to practice now by not talking to me. 
Rob went over the whole situation on his way back, and when he got in sight of the girl his plan was made. She stood waiting for him with a new look on her face. Her sullenness had given way to a peculiar eagerness and anxiety to believe in him. She was already living that free life in a far-off wonderful country. No more would her stern father and sullen mother force her to tasks which she hated. She'd be a member of a new firm. She'd work, of course, but it would be because she wanted to and not because she was forced to. The independence and the love promised grew more and more attractive. She laughed back with a softer light in her eyes when she saw the smiling face of Rob looking at her from the sunbonnet. "'Now you mustn't do any more of this,' he said. "'You go back to the house and tell your mother you're too lame to plow any more today. And it's too late, anyhow.' "'Tonight,' he whispered quickly, Eleven. Here.' The girl's heart leaped with fear. "'I'm afraid.' not of me are you no i'm not afraid of you rob i'm glad of that i i want you to to like me julie won't you i'll try she answered with a smile to-night then he said as she moved away to-night good-bye good-bye he stood and watched her till her tall figure was lost among the drooping corn leaves there was a singular choking feeling in his throat. The girl's voice and face had brought up so many memories of parties and picnics and excursions on far-off holidays, and at the same time such suggestions of the future. He already felt that it was going to be an unconscionably long time before eleven o'clock. He saw her go to the house, and then he turned and walked slowly up the dusty road. Out of the may weed the grasshoppers sprang, buzzing and snapping their dull red wings. Butterflies, yellow and white, fluttered around moist places in the ditch, and slender striped water snakes glided across the stagnant pools at sound of footsteps. But the mind of the man was far away on his claim, building a new house with a woman's advice and presence. It was a windless night. The katydids and an occasional cricket were the only sounds Rob could hear, as he stood beside his team and strained his ear to listen. At long intervals a little breeze ran through the corn like a swift serpent, bringing to the nostrils the sappy smell of the growing corn. The horses stamped uneasily as the mosquitoes settled on their shining limbs. The sky was full of stars, but there was no moon. What if she don't come, he thought, or can't come? I can't stand that. I'll go to the old man and say, looky here. Shh. He listened again. There was a rustling in the corn. It was not like the fitful movement of the wind. It was steady, slower, and approaching. It ceased. He whistled the wailing sweet cry of the prairie chicken. Then a figure came out into the road, a woman julia he took her in his arms as she came panting up to him rob judy a few words the dull tread of swift horses the rising of a silent train of dust and then the wind wandered in the growing corn the dust fell a dog barked down the road and the katydids sang to the liquid contralto of the river in its shallows End of Among the Corn Rows by Hamlin Garland Read by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio